Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. And a good morning to you. It it what day is Wednesday? March, March 11th, Thursday. No, I knew it was 11th, Thursday. Yeah, I was off a whole day. Almost I Friday. Down? I've been here all morning. Why did I write down Wednesday on this one? I, I don't know, but in your defense, I wanted to say Monday for some reason. Well, I will say this. <laughs> March 11th stood out in my head this morning for one big reason. That was exactly one year ago. Today, the WHO declared the coronavirus uh, a worldwide pandemic. And we have a, a local resident, well, San Marcos man, who was actually discharged from the hospital after a 132 day stay there from numerous COVID related complications. Yeah, it's been a big week for Mr. Rivas. Uh, yep, 132 days. He was at Christus Santa Rosa. Uh, according to hospital, Rivas walked into the ER back way back on October 30th of 2020, complaining of severe shortness of breath. He was diagnosed with COVID, admitted to the intensive care unit and placed on a ventilator just three days later. And over several weeks, the 55 year old developed complications related to COVID-19 and was eventually transported to Crista Santa Rosa, New Braunfels after developing a heart complication. Well, Rivas was eventually transferred back to San Marcos on January 27th. And now discharged, Rivas ends an over four month hospital stay no longer needs oxygen and he can walk with the help of a walker. Uh, hospital officials say he received physical, occupational and speech therapy twice a day during his recovery. Hospital staff are calling him a walking miracle, but one of the longest hospital stays in our area that we know of again at 132 consecutive days receiving medical care. Yeah, Mr. Rebus, we're glad you're out and glad you're doing OK. Let's look at today's night at nine. Today marks one year since the pandemic was officially declared. President Joe Biden will deliver his first primetime address tonight at 7 to commemorate the anniversary and remember the lives lost. Congress has sent President Biden the nearly $2 trillion COVID-19 relief bill is expected to sign the bill tomorrow. Eligible Americans should receive $1,400 stimulus checks by the end of the month. The Texas Department of Health and Human Services is expanding COVID-19 vaccine eligibility. Starting Monday, all Texans 50 and older will be able to receive the vaccine. Today marks the 10 year anniversary of the earthquake, tsunami and nuclear disaster that hit northeastern Japan. More than 18,000 people died and nearly a half a million people were displaced. A record surge of children are crossing into the U.S. from Mexico by themselves. Internal documents show U.S. Border Patrol is holding thousands of unaccompanied migrant children for longer than the law allows in facilities unfit for minors. Today, the House is set to vote on legislation that would expand background checks on all commercial gun sales. The legislation has three Republican co-sponsors. The fourth court of appeals has agreed with a lower court ruling that San Antonio's paid sick leave ordinance is preempted by the Texas Minimum Wage Act and is therefore unconstitutional. This stops the ordinance from taking effect while the case continues to work its way through the courts. Spurs say LaMarcus Aldridge is no longer with the team. Coach Greg Popovich says they have, quote, mutually agreed to work on some opportunities with him that will be elsewhere, end quote. Prince William is defending his royal family against accusations of racism made by his brother, Prince Harry, and sister-in-law, Meghan, during an interview with Oprah Winfrey. During a visit to a London school, Prince William said the royals are, quote, very much not a racist family, end quote. And that's today's Nine at Nine. Well, all week, it seems the warming trend has continued. I mean, look at that. We're sitting right around 70 degrees here at the top of the hour. Yeah, a little warmer and still without a full rain event oh. so far. Yeah, we need rain. We're going to show you the drought monitor coming up here in just a few minutes. It's, it's going from bad to worse. 70 degrees right now. We got up to 82 yesterday. We'll be right in that range again today, especially considering the fact the sun is already trying to pop out. 70 degrees at the airport. Dew point is at 63, so it is extremely humid. South southeasterly winds at 16, still breezy too. And uh, we'll get those temperatures up close to 82 again this afternoon. It's so very similar to yesterday, not much of a change in the pattern. That doesn't come until the weekend. 68 Bulverde, 72 in New Braunfels, 66 Bandera, 66 Tarpley. It's mostly cloudy for much of us, but again, the sun's trying to peek through here and there. For those in town for spring break, or maybe you're headed to SeaWorld, Six Flags, temperatures will be in the 80s next few days. A little better chance of rain perhaps on Saturday, 
but still we're going to hold off on any really good chances for rain until Saturday night into Sunday morning. We're going to detail that chance for thunderstorms coming up here in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Spring break. We have noticed lighter traffic. Uh, things are looking great out there at I-10 and Hebner. If there are any major accidents and we see them on Transguide, we'll let you know over this hour. Top stories we're following today. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office has identified the second man killed in a crash on the northwest side as 25-year-old Khalid Valencia. 24-year-old Jovan Cruz was also killed in that crash. Police say Valencia and Cruz were speeding on Houseman Road near I-10 around 2 yesterday morning. Investigators tell us their car hit a barrier, went airborne, and hit the median on the main lanes of I-10 itself. No other vehicles were involved in that crash. A man is dead after San Antonio police say he was shot moments before crashing his car into an apartment building. Right now, we're still waiting to learn that man's name. This happened sometime around 4 this morning in the 2600 block of Westward Drive at the Westward Plaza apartment complex. Neighbors reported hearing gunshots and saw the man's car drive into the apartment's office. Police say the man had a gunshot wound to his left side and later died there at the scene. Investigators are not sure if the man died from the gunshot wound or the impact from the crash. They're still looking for the person who probably pulled the trigger. Firefighters had to rescue a woman after a driver crashed into her north side apartment overnight. Police say the driver launched off the retaining wall of an elevated parking lot and dropped into the apartment just before 1230 this morning. This was 8100 block of Callahan, not far from I-10. Driver told police he stepped on the gas instead of the brakes. The woman was in the kitchen when the crash happened. Police say she was pinned between the man's truck and her stove. Her family told Case that she suffered a cracked rib. First responders took the woman and the driver to University Hospital. Investigators are trying to determine if the man was driving while intoxicated. As we briefly mentioned in the night at nine, President Biden will deliver a primetime address tonight to commemorate the one year anniversary of the pandemic and remember the hundreds of thousands of lives lost. The speech starts at 7 p.m. and you can watch it live right here on KSET 12. But don't worry, you won't miss any of the ABC programming. Station 19, Grey's Anatomy and A Million Little Things will air in their entirety right after President Biden's speech. And since everything is getting pushed back, the night beat will likely start well after 10 and it will also air in its entirety. In your morning headlines, several officers facing charges in the shooting death of a teenager accused of robbery. Mudslides wreak havoc in California and a dramatic rescue after a family is caught inside a burning home. RJ Marquez joins us live here in the studio with those stories and much more. Good morning, RJ. Yeah, good Thursday morning, guys. And we start with new video this morning of a police shooting that led to the death of a teenager in Oklahoma City. And we want to warn you, this video is disturbing. This newly released body cam and surveillance video shows the intense moments before the death of 15-year-old Stavian Rodriguez. Police said he robbed a convenience store at gunpoint before they arrived. Police gave him several verbal commands before the video shows him climb out through a drive through window. You can see him climbing out right there. The video shows him lift his shirt and then put his hands up before taking out a gun and dropping it right there. He reaches toward his back pocket right before several officers open fire. Put your hands up! Put your hands up! Put your hands up! Yeah, that video right there from the uh, police officer's body cam. Court documents say Rodriguez didn't have any other weapons on him, but they did find a cell phone in his back pocket. Five of the six officers who shot at Rodriguez have been charged with first degree manslaughter. All right, many Southern California families are digging out from major mudslides this morning caused by heavy rain in the area. Check these mudslides out. They were reported in Orange County's Silverado Canyon on Wednesday. Mud just flowed down the mountainside, filling backyards and trapping some cars in hubcap deep muck. Yeah, that is some crazy stuff there. Some areas were placed under mandatory evacuation orders. People who can't get out of their homes are being asked to shelter in place until those crews right there are able to clear the roads. Many of the affected areas were scorched by wildfires last fall, leaving the area vulnerable to all of those mudslides. Good luck to those folks there. All right, some Phoenix, some Phoenix police officers jumped into action to save a family from a burning house, and it was all caught on body cam video. So this dramatic rescue took place on 
Saturday night, officers were first on the scene and they rushed into the burning home to rescue a grandmother, her daughter, and four young children. The video shows an officer crashing through a side gate to save the family. Neighbors also helped officers by lifting the kids over a backyard wall to get them safe. The homeowner, Ruby Smith, says she's very grateful to those officers and others who helped. I appreciate them so much. God, there's a crown for them. God is going to crown them for the help that they did for us because no one else had called 911. All right, as you can see from this video right here, the house is pretty much a total loss and it is still not clear what started the fire. The family is staying at a nearby hotel while their church tries to find them a more permanent place to stay. All right, you hear that? That is the sound of wind coming from Mars. Yes, Mars. NASA's rover called Perseverance is on the red planet searching for signs of ancient life. It has already sent back hundreds of photos, but this is the first sound that we're getting from the rover. There's a SuperCam microphone located at the top of the rover's mass. It is also collecting samples that will eventually be sent back to Earth for analysis. And coming soon, guys, probably the uh, go to sleep with the soothing sounds from Mars. <laughs> Instead of, That's what it sounds like. Instead of yes. a white noise machine, it's a red noise machine yes, coming yeah. from Mars. Cool stuff there. Thank you, RJ. See you in <laughs> a bit. Guys. Right now it's 909, 70 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. The Spurs are saying goodbye to one of their veteran players, LaMarcus Aldridge. David and RJ will be back and they'll give us their thoughts on the news and have highlights from the Spurs lost against the Mavericks. Efforts underway now to ensure the blackouts that we all experienced last month don't ever happen again. We're going to check in with Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune. Well, it's no secrets that students are struggling in the classroom. Education experts call this the COVID slide. But after the break here on GMSA at 9, we're talking about how local nonprofit SA Youth is partnering with South San ISD to help students succeed in the classroom and give them a boost of confidence. And a quick check of stocks. The Dow is up about 200 points. We'll be right back. And welcome back. It's 913. The pandemic's effects on students' learning could last for years to come. Local nonprofit SAU says student scores in subjects like math fell by 13 points in comparison to last year. SA Youth is now shifting gears to help students recover from what the Texas Education Agency is calling the COVID slide. Alicia Barrera spoke with two students who say they're thankful the help the organization has been giving them. My dad drives a silo. Gianna Magana is a first grader. To the doctor. She loves school and has big dreams. I wanted to be a police officer. Gianna is specifically good at math. Math is good because your, your brain gets smarter. But reading isn't her favorite. Things happen. She says the assessments on books make it even more challenging. If I read a book, I would get one question wrong by the answers. And then if I get the question wrong, like you get one star off the chart. That's where Blake Barlow from SA Youth steps in. I would tell him, you're a wonderful SA Youth teacher. Marlow is the assistant director of SA Youth's after school program, Out of School Time. It serves 40 South San ISD students, including Gianna and her older sister, Allison. Students get worksheets that help them work on specific academic skills. Really about that. Um, that enrichment on an academic level, social and emotional level. You know, it's like a, a sea of hands for kids, you know, wanting us to come over and check to see how they did and just kind of celebrate whether us putting like a, a hundred on the top of their paper or a smiley face by a question that they got right. The program also has project-based activities that keep learning fun. Well, the first one we did was about baking and this was actually, believe it or not, Allison's idea. She was the one who brought it up and the kids voted for it and they decided to do that as their first project. Hidden in the mix were lessons of science and Allison's least favorite subject, math. The goal for the program is to give students a boost of confidence in life and in the classroom. It's helped me a lot. He's teaching me to do it an easier way than the harder way. And it's like good whenever he helps me because he's like learning me out with reading. 
This SA Youth program is currently exclusive to South San ISD, and the organization does want to expand, but in order to do so, they'll need more federal funding, grants, or even just support from individuals or foundations. So if you're interested in helping out SA Youth and in turn helping out these kids, on KSAT.com we have the full article for this story, and at the very bottom is that link to where you can find out more and donate. Reporting live, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Alicia. It's a common theme around here. We need rain and lots of it, just not all at once. Justin here with an update on our drought index. Yeah, we just got this in this morning. We get them every Thursday. It still looks pretty bleak for most of Texas when it comes to the drought situation. And uh, we do need rain, uh, as Mark said. That's the bottom line here. You look at most of Texas and we're within some sort of drought here. Uh, across South Texas, uh, it is uh, well around Bear County. At least we've got uh, severe droughts, northern Bear County, and it, it has been in this area, Medina County over towards you Valley, where we've been in drought for what seems like a year now. And you go south, it gets a little worse down around Catula. There is extreme drought there. Basically, most of our area is in need of rain. And we look at Medina Lake, always a good barometer, 39 percent full. One year ago, it was 23 feet higher, just to give you some perspective there. So we know that uh, it is continuing to drop. Uh, Canyon Lake, by the way, 87%. Choke Canyon was down quite a bit, so was Amistad. So our, our lakes are in need of some rain, too. As we go outside for you right now, we've got mostly cloudy skies. Sun is trying to shine through. Temperatures sitting at 70. It's warm. It's humid. We're still seeing some breezy winds out of the south southeast at 16 miles per hour and cloud cover it's off and on. We're getting some high clouds on top of some low clouds, so that's creating mostly cloudy conditions. 71 degrees at Port SA, 70 Randolph, 69 Stinson, 72 right now in New Braunfels. 70 Carrizo Springs, 73 Catula. Places down to the south San Antonio got close to 90 degrees yesterday. It was hot. I expect a repeat today. Not, not much has changed here other than the dew points have crept up a little bit. We're starting to see dew points now in the mid 60s, closing in on 70. So it is extremely sticky out there. It's uh, a shame that that's not resulting in any sort of rain, but we're not going to get lift until probably Saturday night, and that's when we could see some thunderstorms. Wind gusts right now anywhere from 25 to maybe even 35 miles per hour out towards Rock Springs. Winds will stay breezy today. We'll see some gusts. Up close to 30 from time to time, but generally around 25 mile per hour wind gusts here in San Antonio into this evening. Here's the big picture. Most of Texas underneath some cloud cover, a few rain showers up across parts of Oklahoma. Here's our next big storm system as it churns out over California, bringing snow and rain there, and it's shoving some high clouds in our direction. As the forecast goes forward in time here, and as this big system moves towards uh, the Rocky Mountains, there's going to be a ton of snow up in Colorado. Just looking at some of the numbers, we're talking two, three feet. Uh, places west of Denver, Denver could pick up two feet of snow. Some models are outputting something like five feet of snow. That's just incredible. Very heavy snow with this system, but it will also produce some thunderstorms. We'll get a line of storms developing out West Texas Saturday night. That'll work its way east. Uh, after midnight, I think we'll get some storms here in San Antonio, but by Sunday morning, that line is moving east and we'll get to uh, clear out and then uh, we'll see some more sun uh, Sunday afternoon. As far as severe weather goes, the risk here in yellow is slight risk on Saturday. So San Angelo, even maybe down to Rock Springs, Del Rio, we can see a couple of strong storms and then the risk uh, moves east on Sunday. By and large, San Antonio is not uh, included there, but we'll watch for a couple of strong storms here and there. We can forecast. Isolated shower, breezy, humid on Saturday, 80. Front comes through, 60% chance of rain, and then clearing on Sunday, 75. And don't forget, it is daylight saving time. The sunrise will switch from 645 to 744, and the sunset 641 to 741. So we sort of switch things up there. 82 Friday, 80 on Saturday, 75 Sunday, and then we're back in the 80s next week. Maybe another chance of rain by Wednesday. Guys. All right. I'll try to remember about the time change. Thank you, Justin. Don't forget. Wow, all that snow in Colorado, just I mean, the ski resorts has to be a boon to them if anybody can get up there to ski exactly. in the first place. Yeah. 920 right now, 71 degrees. And all week long, our Davis Sears has been checking out places with fun activities for kids during spring break. So let's check in with him to see what he has coming up today. One of the most popular places you can visit this spring break is SeaWorld. When we come back, we're going to talk shows, we're going to talk rides, we're going to talk water, and of course, we're going to talk 
Public Safety. We'll visit with one of the members of the staff here at SeaWorld. Coming up next, live from SeaWorld. Welcome back. Just about 924 this morning, we continue our spring break series, checking out fun activities for the whole family to enjoy. And our David Sears is live from SeaWorld and Aquatica. David, what safety measures are in place there? Oh, they're going to have all those kind of safety measures in place for you guys. But first, let me start off with a little inside information for you. Apparently, Clyde and Seymour have been working their fins off, their <laughs> flippers off. They've been ready to go for spring break. So they got something special planned for all the kids to come to see Clyde and Seymour today and all the other shows here at SeaWorld. Chuck Rowe with the SeaWorld is here with us to visit. I know you guys have got to be excited. You've been open a little bit throughout the year, but to have spring break, and be open and ready to receive some some of these uh, folks to come and enjoy SeaWorld. you got to be just thrilled about we that. We have just been just eager beavers, just waiting for the crowds to come in. Of course, SeaWorld open the rest of this week, all of next week for spring break. The sun's coming out. That feels yeah. so good. Isn't that it's nice? amazing. Two weeks ago, <laughs> we were freezing. <laughs> and now we want people to come out, have a great time, enjoy the animals. You talked about Clyde and Seymour. Fantastic presentation there. And let's not forget about the orcas. We have Orca Encounter where you learn about the orca whales and what you can do to help them in the natural environment. We have a great show near and dear to my heart because I performed in it for many years. It's with the beluga whales and the Pacific white sided dolphin called Ocean Discovery where you learn about these animals. Many ways to learn about the animals. You can actually get in the water with dolphins and with beluga whales in, in some of our swim programs. You can find out all about these at SeaWorldSanAntonio.com. Let's talk safety. What do you guys have planned for the folks that come in here? How are you going to keep them safe during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, you know, safety of our, of our guests and our ambassadors and our animals, utmost priority here. So we do, we still have our safety measures in place. We want to, we're going to err on the side of caution. So reservations have to be made online. Once you come to the park, uh, we're going to take your temperature, make sure that you're, you're feeling good. And then throughout your day, we're going to ask that you wear your mask. We've got sanitation stations all over the place where you can use the hand sanitizer. We are, hand, we are sanitizing. Our staff is going around and sanitizing frequently touched areas. And then we realize with the mask, sometimes you might need a little break. We've got about 18 what we call relaxation zones where you can sit down in a recliner or on a couch, take off your mask, socially distance from each other, get a little bit of a break and a little, little, uh, little uh, insider scoop. Many of those uh, relaxation zones have a bar right next to it. There you go. <laughs> Let's go right now. <laughs> so, so we're ready for the adults and the kids here at SeaWorld. <laughs> hey, by the way, we're going to head over to Aquatica in just a few minutes and check out the water park and see how they are prepared for all the folks that are coming in today and throughout spring break. So we'll be back uh, over in the water park coming up in a few minutes. And no, we won't be swimming today. I was just going to We were ask. just cold not too long ago. I was we're, not, say we're not getting in the pool. Probably a little on the uh, cool side, no. right? No. Still looking forward to it. Thank yeah. you, David. Thank you, David. Cool. <laughs> right now it's 926, about 70 degrees. And the Spurs kicked off their second half of the regular season with a loss against the Mavs. David and RJ will be back with highlights and discuss what's next for the silver and black. Governor Greg Abbott slamming President Biden's uh, immigration policies. We'll check in with Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune for what specifically the governor is criticizing. And let's take a quick look out at TransGuy. There's a loop 410 or Harry Wordsbach right there. Looks like they're diverting traffic to the side of the road. Governor Greg Abbott on Tuesday declared that the border is in a crisis and he's pointing a finger at the Biden administration's border policies. And the legislature right now focused on how the state can better prepare for extreme weather. Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune joins us today to talk about those efforts. Good morning, Alana. Good morning. Figures released Wednesday show the Rio Grande Valley and the El Paso sectors remain the busiest crossing points as more than 100,000 people were either apprehended or surrendered to authorities along the U.S.-Mexico border. Governor Abbott is slamming President Biden's immigration policies. What specifically? Yeah, basically he's saying that, uh, you know, the, the humane approach and the fact that Biden is undoing uh, pretty much all of the Trump administration's immigration policies through executive order, uh, that's creating a market for criminals across the border to prey on these vulnerable migrants. Uh, in addition to, you know, saying that uh, the president cares more about foreigners than he does Americans in this humane approach in contrast to the Trump administration, uh, you know, he, he has points in the fact that it is 
Uh, the numbers are uh, crisis level, even though the Biden administration is not calling it that. And many of them are unaccompanied minors that are starting to to really overflow uh, shelters and things like that. But this is also, you know, on the politics end, uh, you know, a popular foe for uh, then Attorney General uh Abbott and then governor during the Obama administration, he said he wakes up and and sues the federal government uh, and a lot of those uh, lawsuits in the past during that previous Democratic administration revolved around immigration. And Alana, now to the Capitol where today a powerful Texas House committee is set to consider one of Speaker Dade Phelan's top legislative priorities this session, a bill that would address the governor's emergency powers during a pandemic. But before the hearing convenes, a number of major changes are being prepared, including the creation of a legislative oversight committee. What sort of power would this committee have? Well, uh, the potential to terminate a uh, disaster declaration from the governor, uh, particularly in times when the legislature is not in session, which have been uh, some of the uh, criticisms from both uh, those in uh, the governor's party and across the aisle, uh, wanting to be called back to uh, the Capitol to address uh, the, the pandemic response rather than it being a unilateral response from the governor. And so part of that uh, committee, uh, it's proposed to be a 10 member committee that would include the lieutenant governor, House Speaker, and then uh, members of key committees in both chambers to address those things. And, and if a declaration is in place for, I think, about 30 days, uh, that committee could convene in an interim uh, between sessions and, uh, you know, uh, evaluated to see if it should stay in place. Legislature also focused on how the state could be better prepared for extreme weather. During a virtual conversation Wednesday, the TRIB hosted a bipartisan conversation with a pair of lawmakers about efforts to ensure that blackouts Texans experienced last month don't happen again. What did you glean from that discussion, Alana? It is a priority uh, for both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, the degree in which they speak to uh, getting it done this session uh, or the consequences if they don't uh, vary, uh, you know, with State Senator Jose Menendez, a Democrat out of San Antonio, saying if we don't get this done after knowing that this was an issue for some 10 years since 2011 when the last cold snap happened and, and part of the grid went offline, uh, we shouldn't be reelected from the governor on down. On the flip side, you had State Representative Craig Goldman, a Republican out of Fort Worth, uh, you know, say that we need to get this done. He's on, you know, in line with the House Speaker, who is also a Republican, of course, uh, you know, for carrying one of his uh, priority bills, and that's weatherizing uh, the equipment uh, that failed. Again, it failed in 2011 and, and in 2021. And so, uh, you know, like I said, varying degrees, some, you know, with the Republican being a little more careful, knowing that they are in the majority, but there is a lot of eyes on this. And of course, people still reeling from the effects of last month's storm. Yes, a lot of people. Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Alana. Thank you. Outside with live cam. Springtime in Texas usually means allergens. Let's get an update from Justin. Yeah, the humidity has been up last few days, of course, and that looks like it has kicked up the mold count that jumped up into the moderate category today. Not exactly what we wanted to see. It's at 540 Hackberry, Mulberry, the tree pollens. They've been staying low for the most part, but we haven't made it into oak season yet. We'll see how that turns out. Uh, looking at temperatures, 72 New Braunfels, 66 Canyon Lake, 69 Comfort, 67 in Bandera. It's mostly cloudy uh, across the area. And the weekend forecast, we've got plans both Saturday and Sunday. Saturday is going to be a humid, breezy, mostly cloudy day. Our rain chance kicks in Saturday night into early Sunday morning. I think most of Sunday, though, is going to be pretty nice clearing, albeit a little bit windy, 75 degrees on your Sunday. Steph? That's good for Sunday. Thank you, Justin. And the Spurs tipped off the second half of the season without one of their former All-Star players. It's the end of an era. LaMarcus Aldridge officially no longer with the team. RJ and David are back to discuss this big move. And, of course, Spurs lost to the Mavs last night. First, RJ, uh, well, was there any indication this decision so with Aldridge was coming? For leadership. Well, Mark, I think we all kind of saw the writing on the wall here. I mean, obviously the Spurs have kind of moved on with a younger group of players, but uh, nonetheless, it was still pretty jarring to actually see the end of uh, LaMarcus Aldridge's time in San Antonio. You think about it, he was signed here uh, six years ago. There was a lot of promise. Uh, you know, probably he was the highest profile free agent signing the Spurs had ever had at the time. It was a really, really big deal. And to really kind of see it, 
unfulfilled promise, um, and it's kind of a tough way to see it end, but I think, again, the writing was on the wall based on LaMarcus going to the bench. David, uh, we had been talking about this for some time, so what was your initial uh, reaction to uh, Coach Pop's news? Well, I was kind of surprised that they just agreed to let him go rather than try to trade him. And maybe they did try to trade him and maybe they couldn't get enough for him or they had to give up too much along with him for a good trade. But I'm, I'm really not surprised that he didn't fit. He was having a hard time adjusting to coming off the bench. He'd been injured a lot. Well, we, at least we think he'd been injured a lot. So, you know, I'm not really surprised that he's not with the team anymore. I'm just kind of surprised at the way it happened and how quick it happened. But, you know, they're trying to let him go. I mean, that's the way Pop has always operated the San Antonio Spurs. He wants to find the best place for his players. He has a lot of respect for LaMarcus Aldridge. LaMarcus did a lot for the, this team when he came here. He was one of the hottest free agents when they signed him, and he elected to come to San Antonio. So I, I'm sure Pop feels like he owes him something. And so whatever he can do for him to help him find a team that he can fit in with, Pop will do. So uh, it's kind of kind of strange to see him gone, but that gives a lot of playing time to a lot of these young guys, and, and they got to develop these young guys if they're going to ever, you know, get back to where they were four or five years ago. So not really mm -hmm. surprised that he's gone. Maybe a little surprised on on the quickness that he that he left. Have we talked yet about next steps for the Spurs and Lamarcus? Yeah, and uh, David mentioned it there. So ESPN is reporting that the Spurs are still trying to work out something with LaMarcus as far as a trade. Uh, there's a lot of NBA teams that I think can definitely benefit from having LaMarcus on their roster. Unfortunately, the Spurs were just uh, were just not one of them at this current point in time in their, uh, you know, as they're building or sort of rebuilding the team. So uh, there is some discussion there. The trade deadline is March 25th. So the Spurs do have a little bit more time here to kind of figure out what they're going to do. And maybe that was a reason why they just felt, you know what, it's best to just sit him right now. This way he doesn't get hurt or, uh, you know, nothing like that happens. And maybe they can agree on what's best for both parties. David? Yeah, exactly. But once again, if, if they got to give up too much to trade him, I'm not sure they're willing to do that. But if they can get, you know, maybe a draft pick, maybe something like that, just to just to help along the way, that that'd be great too. And and a lot of teams, what are the other teams going to have to give up to get Lamarcus in a trade? Is it going to be worth taking that salary that he's got, which is only what about half the 24 million he was getting paid this year? He's a free agent at the end of this year. So what are the other teams going to have to give up to get him? If they hold out long enough, the Spurs might just let him go without a trade. Then you can sign him and, and not hardly pay much at all, and you don't have to sacrifice any of your young guys either. So we'll see how it works out. Didn't one of you say you'd be surprised if LaMarcus Aldridge finished the season in a Spurs yes. uniform? We we had been saying it for some time without really trying to say it. <laughs> so I think, again, uh, with the injuries that they were listing him under, it was a little bit of a, you know, still McIlness. OK, maybe I, I honestly thought that they were trying to not let him play as much, maybe to keep him fresh, but also to not have him get hurt as we moved ahead towards the deadline. Oh, and there was a game last night, too. Oh, Mark. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, David, you want to take look this like one? They look like they've been off for a few days. <laughs> yeah, I'll take this one. You, first off, you had three or four guys that hadn't played in a while because of the uh, safety protocols they were in. Derek White and uh, who else? There was like three or four guys that, that, that hadn't played. White looked a little rusty. They looked a little rusty coming off the All-Star break. And I, I was expecting it. I thought maybe they would be able to pull that one out. But Luka Doncic, that, that guy's just, that, that's an incredible basketball player. They did a great job on him for like three and a half quarters. But then the Spurs offense fell apart. They missed 11 shots in a row in the fourth quarter when it was tied they went off this this incredible 11 shot in a row streak that they missed and that was the end of that yeah tough loss for the spurs there against uh, dallas who has really kind of started to heat up so this is going to be an interesting race down the stretch here uh demar de rosen had another nice game 30 points but you could tell that uh guys like rudy gay Derek white they had not played in about a month so uh, they definitely looked uh, pretty rusty out there. So coming up next for the Spurs, they are back home in San Antonio and in front of fans for the first time since the pandemic. Yay! Yes, we're all excited about this. Uh, they are limiting capacity to 
3,200 fans, but it is going to be a lot of fun tomorrow night at the AT&T Center. A lot of cool fan stuff going on. And, of course, all the health and safety protocols are now in place there at the arena. So it, this is going to be a lot of fun. I think the Spurs still in good position here, even with the LaMarcus news, the loss last night. But I think that they're going to turn things around here in a bit. Thank you, RJ. Right now it is 941, and we're not done with David Sears yet, are we? No, we're going to see him back shortly. He'll be at SeaWorld to tell us more about spring break activities. We'll be right back. Welcome back, 945, the weather warming up. What better way to cool off than go to a local water park? Yeah, it's a good idea. SeaWorld's Aquatica reopened just in time for spring break, and our David Sears is there with a live look at all the fun going on. Hey, David. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Did you guys not think I was going to get in the wave pool? Now, we're not very far but out into the wave pool, but we are in the wave pool. Come on, Lise. Lee's College is the vice president of Aquatica. It's a little chilly. Do you not have the heater on? It's Texas. The sun's our heater. <laughs> oh, great. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, my toes are going to be numb here in a minute. It's going to feel like about three weeks ago. First off, Aquatica Water Park. Talk about the safety measures that you guys have had to take in order to let folks come in and enjoy this park. That's a great question. We've done a lot of things in our park. We have um, limited reservations to come in to enjoy the park for the day. So we always enjoy having our guests come out. They make those reservations online. We have sanitation stations everywhere. We're constantly sanitizing and cleaning anything from our loungers to our restaurant facilities to our restrooms, as well as even a hand railing all throughout the park. So we do encourage guests to wear their, their face masks as they walk through. But obviously when they're actually enjoying the attractions or on the towers, we aren't requiring the face mask because obviously while you're going down those water towers, we want them to be safe while not wearing a face mask at that time. So lots of different safety things. Yeah, you can space them out pretty well when they're coming down the tubes and, and those rides, but what about here in the, in the wave pool? How, you, how you, did you take care of that? And by the way, we've got 23 seconds before the wave starts before crashing, the wave. So, so talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> so we did actually a lot to see what our park could take to make sure that we maintain that social distancing in the park. So a lot of math on my end to see what we could do to get as many people into the park safely to enjoy all of our attractions. Our, our towers have blue lines on them. Our, we have uh, people that are helping click how many people are in each attraction and make sure everyone can enjoy every attraction that we have here safely. So is it gonna be people kind of like reminding people Stay over here, go over there, kind of, kind of space out a little bit, oh, no, no, like a lifeguard put, would do. <laughs> kind of. The lifeguard's more focused on the actual safety of the patrons, but we have those people um, to help remind folks to, to remain socially distanced. Oh, we might want to move uh -oh. up. <laughs> uh -oh. Let's see what happens. Ooh. Ooh. Right, that's good. <laughs> Refreshing. Shall we start the day? That's good. <laughs> Hey, it was about three weeks ago, I was freezing, standing out in <laughs> yeah. snow. Now I'm cold, standing in water. There you go. This is crazy. At least, thank you very much. You're welcome. All the best this week. A lot of fun out here at SeaWorld once again. Fish, animals, water. What else do you need? And sun. Look, look. There you go, sun. sun. <laughs> Have fun, David. David Sears live out of SeaWorld and Aquaca. What do you need? Probably about 10 more degrees. And yeah. uh, Justin here was more on our warm up and our weekend chances of rain. You know, David happen, brings though. up a good point. It's hard to hard to conceptualize the idea that, you know, a couple of weeks ago it was nine degrees. It doesn't yeah. compute at all. It's really yeah. strange to see that. But yeah, we're getting into the spring like type pattern here where you can get out and maybe get in a pool, although I think it's still a little chilly for that. Uh, you look outside right now, we've got mostly cloudy skies, 70 degrees. South southeasterly winds at about 16 miles per hour. That wind has been ushering in a ton of moisture, so it's sticky. Dew points have risen into the 60s now. Uh, 70s across Bear County, you got 60s up in the Hill Country, 66 right now in Kerrville, 69 in Comfort. Just like yesterday, it's a little cooler as you get up towards Rock Springs and Junction, but with 70s already on the map, it's almost a guarantee that we'll get into the 80s this afternoon. We got up to 82 here in town yesterday. And the winds, just like yesterday, are gusty. We've got gusts to 30 now in Hondo, gusting to 26 in Kerrville, 29 in New Braunfels. So it'll be another breezy day, too, with those winds out of the south, southeast. Pretty consistent here, gusts to around 25, sustained, I'd say 10 to 20. And we look at the moisture. Dew points have surged higher. That moisture now surging all the way out into West Texas and Wichita Falls, North Texas. We've got dew points in the low 60s, which puts us squarely in the muggy category. Did see a few dew points trying to get up close to 70. That is definitely spring-like air. 
And as we look at the dew point tracker, it stays humid and then the bottom falls out. We'll get some really dry air on Sunday as a frontal boundary moves through. Builds back up on Tuesday, maybe a couple showers Tuesday. Another front comes through, knocks it back down. So we'll be on that roller coaster ride when it comes to humidity over the next five to seven days or so. Visible satellite picture shows we've got a lot of cloud cover. It's mostly cloudy, but the sun is shining through as David showed you in a few spots. A lot of this is some high cloudiness and with a little bit of low cloudiness mixed in. So uh, it's going to be mostly cloudy today, tomorrow, probably Saturday. Then our storm system moves in and with the dew point falling off, clouds will clear out too. We'll have some much uh, drier air and sunny skies by Sunday afternoon. This storm system is a big one. It'll make its way through the Four Corners region, producing snow as it does. And we mentioned earlier, just a ton of snow in Colorado. Forecast right now is for two to four feet. Some places could see a little bit more than that. We're talking feet here, not inches. Uh, so just a ton of snow on the front range there in the Rockies and uh, Colorado. Out ahead of it, it will produce some thunderstorms. We think there could be some stronger storms in Oklahoma as we get into Saturday out in West Texas. And that line will progress east. We'll be on the tail end of things here, but I still think we could see a strong storm or two. This line will move east by Sunday morning and skies will clear as we talked about. The severe weather risk area in yellow here, that's where we think most of the severe, severe weather will be on Saturday, but notice a marginal risk does extend down towards Del Rio on Sunday. That shifts east. So San Antonio not included in that right now, but again, strong storm or two possible as this front moves through. Saturday and Sunday will be very different. Mostly cloudy, shower, humid, breezy on Saturday, 80, and then uh, clearing on Sunday, but windy, 75. And after that, uh, we'll get back into the 80s. It looks like Monday and Tuesday, maybe some morning fog on Tuesday, and another chance of rain on Wednesday. We'll be right back. Good morning. Hey guys, good morning. Coming up on live, the host of the Bachelor finale, Emmanuel Acho. Plus, we'll learn how to be healthy at home with your pets. See you soon on live. As the earth gets hotter, natural surfaces for ice hockey are vanishing. Coming up today on the News at Noon, how hockey legends in Russia are bringing attention to climate change. And right now we're sitting at 72. We'll be up around 82 this afternoon. Pretty similar weather today, tomorrow and Saturday, but Front comes through Saturday night, brings a good chance of some thunderstorms turning windy and clearing out on Sunday. Mask mandate isn't the only thing that changed yesterday. Texas Parks and Wildlife made an announcement. State parks will return to normal capacity in time for spring and summer camping seasons. That's right. So Texas State Parks have become a strategic and thoughtful process of expanding statewide as Governor Greg Abbott's order to open the state 100% 100 goes into effect well, went into effect. Along with those orders, Abbott has lifted the statewide face mask mandate. And so for these parks, they will be strongly encouraged for guests, especially when indoors or in areas where it's hard to social distance from others. All right, Texas Parks and Wildlife has also removed the limit on the number of people allowed in a group. Before Wednesday, groups larger than 10 or any number that was not part of the same family or household were prohibited, but that has now changed. That has. Uh, so they ha they're going to have capacity limits, but that's something that they've had even before COVID-19. Uh, they said capacity limits were already typical before the pandemic for some heavily trafficked parks. For all the details on all of this, the article's right there on ksat.com. Have a great day, guys. See you later.